गुड इवनिंग एवरी वन आई एम पद्मनाभ भागवत सीनियर डायरेक्टर कॉपरेट रेटिंग ऑन बी एफ ऑफ कैर रेटिंग वेरी वॉम वेलकम टू ऑल फॉर दिस वेबिनार ऑन शुगर इंडस्ट्री एंड वी सिंसियरली अप्रिशिएट योर टाइम इन ज्वाइनिंग अस टूडे टॉपिक इज एथेनॉल ब्लेंडिंग स्ट्रक्चरल चेंज फॉर शुगर इंडस्ट्री टूडे वी हैव विद एन एस्टिम पैनल टू डिस्कस एंड गेट सम इन साइट ऑन द स्ट्रक्चरल चेंज विच द इंडस्ट्री इज करेंटली विटनेसिंग आई वुड लाइक टू इंट्रोड्यूस अवर एमिनेंट पैनलिस्ट टू ऑल ऑफ यू Our first guest today is Mr. Vijay Banka, Managing Director at Dwarke Sugar Industries Limited. Mr. Banka is associated with the company since 2007. He is a chartered accountant and has experience of over three decades in finance and strategy. Our next guest is Mr. Nalin Gupta, Joint Chief Financial Officer at Dampur Sugar Mills Limited. Mr. Gupta is associated with Dampur Group since 1996. He is a chartered accountant and has over 25 years of experience in finance. And our next guest is Mr. Vinit Manaktala, Director of Finance and Chief Financial Officer at DCM Shriram Industries Limited. Mr. Manaktala is associated with the company for over 26 years. He is a management professional with over three decades of experience in finance and strategy. My heartfelt thanks to our guest speakers for joining this session. In the past. sugar sector has been grappling with cyclicality and large gain areas while the industry survived partially on the periodic government funded bailouts and subsidies as we all know the sugar industry is going through transformational changes through various policy measures and industry efforts are creating business models which are more sustainable by increasing the ethanol blending the ethanol blending program aims to increase ethanol levels in petrol to 20% by 2025 Post the introduction of biofuel policy more sugar companies are expanding their distillery capacity government's consistent support through various policy measures including the move to increase the ethanol prices year on year is well supporting the framework of higher blending in fact just a couple of days back the cabinet committee of economic affairs increased the ex mill price of ethanol by 1 to 1 and 1/2 rupees per liter It is also worth noting that the global sugar market is expected to report a deficit this sugar season and export dynamics are expected to favor India. With tight global demand supply scenario, favorable policies, sugar exports and ethanol blending, the sector looks on track with its transformational plan. Are all these measures a long-term solution to escape the sectoral cyclicality and reinstate sustainable earnings for sugar companies? we will be gathering a perspective from our panelists in a short while today we would be discussing at length the key updates and structural changes that we are witnessing in the sugar sector briefly we would be touching upon the global trends to understand how some of the changes that are being witnessed in india have already been adopted in sugar producing countries globally the key messages that we would like to share as take away from the webinar are sugar surplus is likely to continue but the demand supply dynamics in the, in the in the industry are improving rapidly exports of sugar and ethanol which we are recognizing as an e factor for the industry would balance out the sugar surplus ethanol would become a vital cog in in assuring structural changes in the industry there is a huge untapped potential and we believe that significant capex on distilleries would be done in the next 3 years the government's firm plans on e20 rollout and incentives for ethanol production would probably enthuse the industry towards the capex the product fungibility between sugar and ethanol would support cash flows of sugar companies we will also discuss uh, discuss our take on the rollout of e20 its challenges and way forward overall we believe that the credit metrics of integrated players would improve going forward these are some of the key messages and my colleagues jasmine and ravlin will take you through the rest of the presentation which care has put together post this presentation we will have a panel discussion and then a q and a session with the audience may i now request my colleague jasmine director corporate ratings to begin the presentation over to you jasmine thank you sir good evening and a warm welcome to everyone This slide gives a quick overview of the global sugar footprint and also the major sugar producing states in India. As can be seen in exhibit 1 which shows the global production, India is the second largest producer of sugar in the world after Brazil, accounting for 19% of the global production. Brazil accounts for 
states namely up maharashtra and karnataka contribute approximately 75 to 85% of india's sugar production with up holding the highest share in the pie this is illustrated in exhibit 2 going on to the next slide this slide shows that sugarcane remains the most attractive crop for the farmers to produce and is expected to remain so in the future therefore the acreage under cultivation is also expected to be high as can be seen in exhibit 3 over the years the government has been increasing the sap and frp this has led to sugarcane crop being one of the most remunerative one for farmers historically as can be seen in the graph compared to the msp fixed for paddy or wheat sap and frp is higher further apart from these prices acting as an assured price to the farmer the buyer is also assured as the mills have to compulsorily procure from its catchment area as a result sugarcane acreage has been rising as visible in exhibit 4 even though there are delays in the cane payments by sugar mills the farmers have still continued the production of sugar cane thereby leading to its stable acreage acreage in all the years as can be seen in the graph since 1718 has been increasing except 1920 which was severely hit by drought in maharashtra and karnataka uh, in the upcoming uh, season that is uh, sugar season 21 22 the total acreage under sugar cane is estimated to be around 5.44 million hectares which is about 3% higher than the last sugar season this increase will be major majorly contributed by maharashtra and karnataka regions um going to the next slide here we have depicted the different phases that the industry has witnessed since sugar season 1516 uh, till sugar season 1617 the industry used to see wide swings in prices every 4 to 5 years fluctuating according to sugar inventory levels We know that lower inventories in sugar season 1617 of 3.9 million tons firmed up the prices, which thereafter declined significantly. Uh, the period from sugar season 1718 to 2021 saw substantial sugar production. MSP in sugar was introduced in February 18. Thereafter, despite the high production levels and piling inventories, domestic sugar prices remained range bound. Uh, the current sugar season uh, that is sugar season 2021 which is just closed um, has closed with a production of 31.2 million tons uh, this is 14% uh, higher production as compared to last sugar season the sugar inventories have however steadily declined in the last two years from 14.6 million tons in september 19 to 8.2 million tons in september 2021 the decline is attributed to higher exports of approximately 7.1 million tons and sacrifice of 2.1 million tons of sugar for ethanol production uh, starting sugar season 21 22 the inventories have started falling further due to exports and diversion to ethanol we believe sugar consumption would be similar to sugar season 2021 levels of approximately 26.5 million tons therefore the sugar inventories are expected to decline to 6.2 million tons approximately to uh, by september 22 while the sugar prices are currently being controlled by the government through msp going forward we believe that with continuous diversion of excess sugar towards ethanol the industry will be self sustained and the improving demand supply dynamics should keep the sugar prices firm now looking at the global trends in the current season EU, India and Thailand are expected to record better sugar production owing to favorable weather conditions. However, there are shortages caused by disruption in Brazil coupled with uh, rising freight rates leading to tight global supplies. As we know, Brazil is dealing with one of its worst drought in 90 years. Uh, the consumption on the other hand is forecasted to rise due to growth in markets such as China and India post the recovery from the pandemic. As per industry estimates a global deficit for 2122 of 3.8 million tons is expected owing mainly to the decline in production in Brazil and higher diversion towards ethanol the expectation of global deficit is also reflected in the strong rally in sugar prices which we can see in the exhibit 6 where white sugar prices have risen to more than 19 cents per pound prices are likely to be remunerative in light of the global deficit situation and this shall continue to aid exports from india Uh, coming to exports as can be seen in this slide india has been a surplus state and a net exporter this has been supported by export incentives which mm -hmm. government has announced from time to time in exhibit 7 we have presented the cost of sugarcane from for some of the sugar producing countries 
India, as we can see, is not cost competitive due to the high cost of production, which is almost 80 to 90 percent higher than other countries. Hence, the exports from India needed to be supported by government through export incentives so far. Uh, as per industry, WTO allows continuation of uh, such export subsidies only until December 23. The surge in export of sugar in 2021 was further aided by the high global prices, even though the government reduced export subsidy from rupees 5.85 per kg to rupees 4 per kg. The exports are key to the sugar industry's prospects in India. However, it alone is not a sustainable solution due, due to its dependence on global demand supply dynamics, um, even international prices and export incentives. However, um, uh, on the other hand, the ethanol story has the characteristics of being a more viable solution for the industry. From here on, I would like to invite my colleague Ravleen Sethi to deliberate in detail on the ethanol story. Over to you, Ravleen. Thank you, Jasmine. Today, India imports 85% of its oil requirement, and India needs to reduce the crude imports as well as comply with the global emission norms. Ethanol blending will not just reduce the import dependency of oil and save the country foreign exchange, but will also be a cleaner fuel. While the crude oil import volume wise have increased by 2% from FI16 to FI20, crude import bill has risen by 15% CAGR over the same period. As ethanol blending would be vital to the government to achieve these objectives, hence government supply is likely to continue for the sector. Also, there's less government control on ethanol sold to OMCs vis-a-vis -vis sugar, which is more controlled. There are multiple prices depending on feedstock, and there's an assured offtake and timely payment by OMCs, leading to no pressure on the working capital. Moving on to certain other facets of ethanol. To give a boost to ethanol, the government has announced remunerative prices for different grades of ethanol, and this has been increasing year on year, as can be seen in the table. Furthermore, the procurement price of ethanol is linked to FRP and normative cost of sugar, and it is not linked to crude oil prices. Hence, if, uh, if, if the FRP or the MSP of the sugar is high, then the procurement price of ethanol will also be hiked proportionately. In the past, even at low levels of oil prices, OMCs have continued the offtake of ethanol from sugar mills. Also, five-year tender for procurement of ethanol have been floated by the OMCs, thereby providing a long-term demand visibility to the millers. However, in the future, should the prices of ethanol increase beyond that of petrol, consumers may have to pay more for ethanol blended fuel. And in such a scenario, the tax breaks on ethanol or some other support schemes may become necessary as a part of government's policy. Now, taking briefly, uh, talking very briefly, you know, on the Brazil, how Brazil has fared with its ethanol blending journey, with India and Brazil being the top sugar producing nations, let us see how they compare vis-a-vis -vis each other. Brazil is the largest producer of sugar globally with 20 to 23% share in the global production and it accounts for 30% of the global ethanol production. In Brazil, the average ethanol blending in petrol is 48% and most vehicles are flex fuel vehicles running on E27 and E100. India, on the other hand, has only 2% share in the global production of ethanol while it has 19% share in the global sugar production. In India, the average blending in petrol is only 8, 8.5% so far, which is significantly low in comparison with Brazil. Vehicles compatible with E20 are to be produced in India. Current slide also shows the historical evolution of Brazilian blending. Brazil achieved the 20% ethanol blending level in 1985 and has been successfully increasing these levels till date. In India, the ethanol blended program also aims to achieve the ethanol blend level with petrol to 20% by 2025. <clears throat> in the current slide in Exhibit 10, we have shown how India is faring against this targeted 20% blending, which we were talking about. Supply of ethanol under the EBP program has increased from 111 crore liters in 1516 to 173 crore liters in 1920 resulting in increased blending percentage from 4% to close to 5.12% respectively. Post the announcement of the national biofuel policy, the blending percentages have further increased to 8.5%, with some states like UP, Maharashtra and Karnataka have even achieved up to 10% blending. Now, uh, as can be seen in the Exhibit 11, the ethanol production capacity in India have grown at a strong CAGR of 17.8% from 222 crore liters in 1516, to 427 crore liters in 1920. UP, Maharashtra and Karnataka account for 83% of this ethanol capacity during 1920. 
So the capacity though has increased is much less compared to the huge demand in the offing. And let us now look at the demand potential and the requirements of capacity augmentation to cater to it. In the current slide, the projected petrol sale is shown along with the blending target percentages and as per the long-term plan of the EBP. We can see that there is a huge demand in the offing. The requirement of ethanol in each ethanol supply year has been calculated, which comes close to 1000 crore liters of ethanol to achieve the 20% blending. And this would mean a saving of approximately 4.6 billion USD of the government's annual import bill. One of the major incentives of the government for EBP is the reduced dependence on crude oil imports. Taking into consideration the limitation of the ethanol production from sea heavy molasses route and its competitive usage in portable and chemical sectors also, the government has therefore encouraged the use of bee heavy and the direct route as well as the food grain based raw material for ethanol production. For this, the country is producing sufficient sugarcane and food grains to meet the growing requirement. So while the feedstock is available as required, let us see in our next slide, how are the capacities faring? Currently, sugarcane and ethanol production are concentrated in three states, which is UP, Maharashtra and Karnataka. Transporting ethanol to other states would entail substantial transportation cost and approvals. So the government has incentivized the grain-based distilleries as well for the production of ethanol gets distributed across the country. As we see from exhibit 12, for 20% ethanol blending, the ethanol required is 1000 crore liters by 2025. Assuming the 25%, that is 334 crore liters are required for other users, the total requirement sums up to 1350 crore liters by 2025. Now, if we assume that, you know, that 6 million ton is being extra produced, the molasses production can fulfill only up to 684 crore liters as depicted in the first row of which 550 will be used for fuel ethanol. So the balance 466 crore liters would have to come from grains. Therefore, the existing distillation capacity of 684 crore liters will have to be augmented as depicted in exhibit 13. The current ethanol capacity is 426 crore liters derived from molasses based and 258 from the grain based distilleries. These are proposed to be expanded to 760 crore liters and 740 respectively. And this should be sufficient for 1350 crore liter requirement. So net net we, are, we see that a production capacity of 1500 crore liters would be catering for a demand of 1350 crore liters where we are building a 10% margin or buffer for various reasons like uh, operational efficiencies, raw material availabilities, etc. And all this translates to a cost of close to 40,000 crore of capital outlay in the next two to three years. Having gone through all these details, let us see the profitability for the millers under different scenarios. As we can see in exhibit 14, by switching from the C grade to B grade molasses, losses incurred in the sugar will be compensated by the ethanol sales. Why the sea heavy route, the sugar sales will be more and ethanol will be lower. While the B heavy route, the sugar sales will be lower and ethanol would be higher. And profit from the ethanol segment by using a B heavy molasses is higher compared to the case which is using C heavy. So this product fungibility will help the industry in many ways. One, this will reduce the cyclicality of the earnings to the millers. Two, it will also reduce the sugar inventories and in all, it will lead to enhanced liquidity because of the faster realization from the OMCs. And finally, this should address the issue of the care areas in the longer run. Players with higher capacities and stronger balance sheets are more likely to benefit from the opportunity. And also looking at the Exhibit 15, going forward with this extensive CAPEX underway for producing the ethanol from B heavy and grain based, the mix going forward will significantly reduce from C heavy. Now, uh, on the E20 rollout, let us talk about the challenges. There are different stakeholders in the entire value chain, and we have listed major challenges which each category will face while rolling out this E20. For producers or the mill owners, they need to make sure that the availability of the sufficient feedstock on a sustainable basis for the uninterrupted production is there. Also, to enable a pan-India rollout, the interstate movement of the ethanol should be allowed, and presently only 14 states have implemented the amended provisions of the IDR Act. Prices of the feedstock and ethanol have to continue to remain remunerative for the millers and augmentation of the capacities as is being planned should happen without any roadblocks. For the OMCs, the challenges would be the transport of ethanol to different places will increase their cost of logistics. Further investment will be required for enhancing the storage capacities and dispensing units for blended gasoline supply at retail, at retail outlets. Lastly, the policy guidelines for differential pricing and labeling of various ethanol blended motor spirit would also have to be done by the government. 
for vehicle manufacturer the challenges can be optimization of the engines for the higher ethanol blends vendors need to develop the ethanol compatible parts and the durability studies have to be conducted on the engines and the feed trials before introducing the e20 compliant vehicles for consumer the largest challenge would be that they need to pay more since the calorific value of ethanol is around two third of the gasoline we'll be deliberating more on all these with our panelists post our presentation Moving on, let us look at the improving credit metrics of the industry. In the current slide, the blue line is depicting the EBITDA margins, with green showing the PAT margins, and the orange line is presenting the overall gearing for the industry for a sample set of players. As per the graph on the slide, we have divided this into different periods. In the period from 2014-15 uh, uh, to 2016-17, the margins are fluctuating due to demand supply mismatch from 1.68% to close to 15% leading to high overall gearing and even net losses in some years. However, from 1819 onwards, post the introduction of the MSP, there is improvement in the EBITDA margins and a sequential decline in the overall gearing levels of the industry. With higher contribution from the B-heavy blends in FI22, we expect the improvement in the EBITDA margins by 130 to 150 bips and corresponding improvement even in the PAT margins. We also expect the gearing levels to be in the comfortable range of 1 to 1.1x for the industry despite the heavy capex for capacity expansion due to healthy generation of the internal accruals. Coming to the rating dispersion of the sugar industry, we can see that the last share of the portfolio has been in the triple B and the below investment grade. However, with the government's focus on the sector and with structural changes that the sector is heading to, the performance of the sector is expected to improve. Financial profile over the next two years for all the integrated players will witness an improvement and hence the credit ratings are also expected to improve with the transformation in the sector. We are already witnessing the green shoots. With this, we come to end of our presentation. Thank you, everyone. And I now hand over to Mr. Bhagwat for moderating the session further. Thank you, Jasmine and Ravlin, for that wonderful presentation. The important messages that we have gathered are that the industry cyclicality would reduce going forward. Also, we expect prices to remain firm in the medium term and sugar exports and ethanol will together lead the structural change in the industry. Having said all this as our perspective, now it's time to seek opinion from the experts in the field or distinguished guest speakers. First, if, my, if, I, if I can come to Mr. Banka. As discussed in our presentation, there is an expected capital outlay of rupees 40,000 crores in the next uh, three years. Do you feel that the industry is ready for uh, commissioning this kind of capacities by 2025 to cater to the government target of lending? A large part of this will have to be funded from banks also. So what is the experience of the industry in being able to tie up uh, funding for this capex? See, the government's uh, directive is very clear. They have, uh, I mean, uh, involved the banks also in the discussion, the company, sugar companies, and all kinds of sugar companies. You see, for a good company with robust balance sheet, it's not at all difficult to obtain bank finances, but uh, they have they've gone a step ahead. And, uh, you know, they worked out, uh, SBIS, for example, worked out standard operating procedures, uh, which would involve signing of the tripartite agreement and working on the escrow mechanism reduction in the margin. So they are working on that. And, uh, I mean, uh, of course, uh, standard operating procedures are already in place. Uh, well, uh, there have been difficulties as I have understood because uh, I mean, like I explained, you know, with, for companies with uh, good with good financials, uh, this is no challenge whatsoever. But uh, there have been some challenges, particularly from uh, from perspective of OMC signing the uh, tripartite arrangement, etc. Agreement. So. Uh, you know, government is actively involved in this. The uh, Department of Food and Public Distribution, uh, together with uh, the Petroleum Ministry, all are uh, involved, and they are trying to iron out all the issues. And I'm sure going forward, uh, this should get implemented. Uh, I mean, uh, the capex uh, that we are talking about, 41,000 crores, should be in place in two to three years' time. Oh, it's great to hear that a significant capex can be expected and the industry is gearing up to take the ethanol opportunity which they have in front of them. Oh, great. Uh, yeah. If I may ask Mr. Gupta, uh, the industry seems to be inclined towards taking up capex for ethanol manufacture through the B-heavy molasses route. We have in our presentation given the fact that profitability is maximum through the direct route. 
why much capex has not been announced through the direct route uh, what are the economics and the differential cost to a miller to produce through the direct route mr gupta you are on uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry i'm sorry See, see, so capex are happening, capex are being announced in a staggered manner. Some of the big capexes are announced. See, there's not much difference in capexes for B heavy and C rub. Only marginal capex are required for going from B heavy to C rub. So that flexibility is required. See, any distillery cannot work on 100%, sugar cannot 100% of juice cane towards ethanol drive off juice, right? means if a, a sugar mill of 1000 tcd is having capacity of uh, a distillery 300 uh, 300 thousand liters a day so it can divert only 38000 tons a day so rest of the production has to go b heavy or c heavy right so and see this is the balancing figure sugar cane ethanol drive out of sugar cane is a balancing figure because you want to run your distillery for 330 days you want to optimize your capacity you want to increase your capacity utilization so in, we cannot uh, uh, go ethanol drive out of sugar cane without any limit there are restrictions on that so we have to uh, devise an optimized mix for feed stock it is also based on the visibility of the sugar cane so expansions are happening and will continue to happen of course, uh, in uh, blocks, in a staggered manner. And there's no, uh, no doubt, uh, doubt about the uh, uh, sugar cane drive ethanol being more beneficial. Ultimately, objective is to reduce the sugar stocks in India. And that is being achieved by this way. Yeah. Can I add on to what Mr. Gupta said just now? You see, uh, typically, uh, distilleries will work on sugar cane juice only during the season. Uh, because uh, you know we have so far not worked out a strategy to store the juice, and it can be a, a, a humongous task, according to me, to store the bag, uh, juice uh, for operation of distillery during the off season. So typically, uh, companies, uh, sugar mills uh, will be working. Uh, you know, till about last year, you know, no permissions were given in UP for uh, using juice directly for making ethanol, but this year permissions have been granted. So. We have tested the waters already with behavior molasses, so now we're going to test waters with uh, juice as well. So the capacities, as Mr. Gupta said, there is very little price differential in the capacities, I mean, in the capex uh, requirement, uh, if one has to produce juice direct, uh, ethanol from juice directly. So the, a typical model would be to, uh, you know, run the distillery, whatever be the capacity, you know, to uh, on juice during the season and during off season, uh, store the bee heavy molasses generated during the season and use it during the off season and thus uh, work in an optimized way for about 330 days as Mr. Gupta said. Right, so that because of the fungibility available of shifting from bee heavy to syrup and syrup to give any time. So industry is working on that only, just to increase the maximize the number of days of operations, as Mr. Banga mm -hmm. said. Yeah. Sure, I think that's a fair point. Why the industry is preferring the B heavy molasses route, but they are in, in fact going towards the juice route also uh, to to optimize the capacities. Great, uh, uh, Mr. Manakpala, uh, if I can come to you on the pricing side, the FRP that is the fair remunerative uh, remunerative price and the SAP the state advised price have been increased by the government for the current sugar season, and recently higher prices have been announced by the government in ethanol prices as well. In the wake of expected global deficit, even the domestic prices are currently firm at average 34-35 per kg. Do you feel that the much talked about MSP hike is now required at all? Well, my take would be that the basic premise of this argument of not having MSP hike is that the price of sugar is expected to hold at the current level of about 35 per kg, given the structural changes related to enhanced production, increase in ethanol pricing and also global demand supply situation. This argument assumes that the situation shall continue. If we agree that the sugar prices are here to stay at these levels, then there is no downside in announcing MSP at a higher level. It only provides an additional policy support to the selling price of sugar to ensure that irrespective of changes in the underlying factors mentioned, 
there is a price stability. Now, why it is particularly important is that there have been rapid downside price movements in the past, which led to accumulation of cane areas. A number of steps have been taken by the government to ensure that this situation doesn't arise. But continues, uh, continued support of MSP may be required because the input side is highly regulated. Domestic supply is controlled and exports at time require government support. Going forward, there shall be increasing pressure from international uh, internationally to reduce the export incentive as was touched upon by in your presentation also. Given the discussions and commitments in this regard with various forums like WTO, etc. Another aspect for timely payment of pain is that uh, pain is that uh, availability of ad adequate bank limits to ensure liquidity of payments. Sugar bank limits are based on market price of sugar, as the drawing power is calculated based on the same. If there's a policy support for sugar prices, it becomes easier for the banks to consider higher sugar price while sanctioning limits. Bankers inherently are uh, conservative given the nature of the job, constant pressures of NPS building up and scrutiny in case advances go bad. So MSP will go a long way in providing the banking sector the confidence that the prices shall hold and they shall be willing to provide timely funds. Another important aspect is that structurally, structurally uh, we shall remain a sugar surplus economy and push towards ethanol is a win-win situation for all stakeholders farmers, sugar industry, government, because it gives the green renewable fuel and helps reduce the import bill and sugar industry being a catalyst for this transformation needs a somewhat controlled environmental framework. A suggestion is that government can work out a formula based on MSP and linking MSP with FRP so that MSP automatically goes up whenever FRP is, realized, is revised. It should also factor in normal inflation so that whenever the conversion costs etc., are also increased, then they can be an increase in MSP if the FRP is static. If this can be done for petrol and diesel prices, where the pricing of international food or exchange parity impact the price of the end product, surely it can be done for the sugar industry where millions of farmers are directly involved and also lacks employed in the sugar mill. Frankly, that's a very good perspective you have put across, Mr. Manaktala. Uh, let me ask Mr. Banka this uh, while we are on the price prices. There's a lot of news that export incentives will not be continued next year in the light of international prices expected to remain firm. Have there been any discussions around uh, around these with the government? Can you please share some uh, insights? Also, at what level of prices would it make sense to export rather than hold it for the domestic market? Uh... There are a few things, you know, firstly, the government has already, uh, the Department of Food and Public Distribution has already announced that there is going to be no subsidy for export of uh, sugar during season 2021-22. However, uh, they have added that preference is going to be given to those who are exporting sugar based, uh, uh, I mean, uh, they, have, they, have, uh, they have in fact advised that we should export as much as we did last time based on our quota. And they have uh, also, uh, in a manner, incentivized the industry, uh, stating that those who are exporting will get some weightage in uh, uh, the computation of their monthly release uh, quota. So as the situation stands, uh, there is going to be no incentive. However, uh, uh, we understand already uh, export contracts have been signed and are under execution for about 2 million tons of uh, export of sugar so uh, you know uh, the prices were uh, the international prices were over and about 20 20.5 cents for a while and I, I i guess that is the time when most of the contracts have been signed uh, so in the meanwhile two things have happened number one the international prices have sobered on a little and the domestic prices have risen so uh, uh, you know we are the industry is caught in a dilemma now here so uh, uh, you know, they uh, since the domestic prices seem good, uh, uh, you know, the incentive for the industry is to sell as much as is possible, of course, based on the quota uh, in the domestic market. <laughs> but having said that, I must also add that, uh, you know, the spurt in the sugar prices that we have seen uh, the last uh, the rally that we have seen since uh, September, now whether it is going to be sustainable, <clears throat> my take is 
now that the sugar uh, has uh, uh, you know the crushing is started uh, and uh, we have always seen that the maharashtra sugar mills are under pressure to uh, uh, you know sell at a lower price if if required so there is going to be a sobering effect on the domestic sugar prices maybe for a month or so and in the meantime we expect some improvement in the international sugar prices also based on the news that we have on the brazilian production so uh, i think that is the time we will see more and more contracts being executed uh, and uh, we should we should uh, export at least about 5 million tons of sugar if not more uh, now at what price uh, what is the quid pro quo price for uh, exporting sugar or for uh, i mean uh, so, or vis-a-vis -vis selling it in the domestic market i think uh, the industry needs to take a holistic view uh we cannot be uh, we cannot compare the export prices uh with uh, the with the domestic market prices uh see in case of export of sugar uh, we produce uh, mostly what is exported is raw sugar uh, so which uh, costs us a little less than what uh, what it costs us to produce the white sugar so there is price advantage uh, there is uh, uh, you know uh, faster inventory turnover advantage in case of export so we should uh, we should be willing to export uh, even if the prices are little lower than the prices that we are getting in the domestic market even when the incentives were announced by the government in the last year uh, i mean uh, including the incentive what we got was less than what we we got in the domestic market so industry has to take a holistic view uh, and then accordingly decide sure thanks uh, since the international prices uh, may remain firm in the near future export incentives in the near term may not be required but uh, yeah one has to see how the prices international prices tend tend to move in the next after six months or so uh, mr gupta let's uh, move from prices to infrastructure side of the ethanol story uh, are there any issues faced by the industry with respect to the procurement of ethanol by omcs uh, uh, interstate transportation of various depots also what is their readiness in terms of uh, infrastructure building like storage tanks dispensing units pipes etc that may be required yeah that's very valid point see uh, till last year we had some challenges but let me tell you i mean during last one year the government and the omcs have done a marvelous job on this front the logistic fronts omcs have ramped up their storage facilities embarkment facilities and all so we are getting a great support from the omc side on this front if you go back to two years three years back there used to be issue challenges of storage facility or uh, lorries and trucks standing there for a number of days so it has reduced a lot so i mean i'm really con congratulate government and omcs they have worked uh, on this logistic part they have done uh, done fantastic job as far as the dispensing units and uh, yes the pilot have already started uh, a roadmap is already there by launched by our honorable prime minister so uh, as he uh, convert by 2025 there should we should see start dispensing units uh, practically so uh, that not a very distant away that we see we are going towards the brazil way i mean ethanol available at the dispensing units at the petrol pumps so yes roadmap is there and i'm sure we'll reach there within time with the support of the government state government central government omcs and the supplies from the industries yeah that's very encouraging actually the infrastructure side of the uh, infrastructure side is being taken care of or is improving rapidly i mean that's very encouraging actually uh, uh, Mr. Manakthala, we touched upon in our presentation that some of the countries have achieved a higher level of ethanol blending in petrol already. Evolution in uh, the evolution in Brazil has been significant over a period, and most vehicles are flex vehicle, uh, flex fuel vehicles there, like oh. close to 80 percent. And mandatory blend is 27 percent from 2015 onward. So please share your thoughts whether India is on the track to achieve the E20 levels, and what uh, challenges or roadblocks do you feel can be encountered on this path? Sir, I think you are on mute. Successful blending program, as the government is envisaging it, can end up saving $4 billion per annum going forward, which you covered in your presentation also. 
besides ethanol being less polluting and offering efficiency more or less equivalent to petrol at a lower cost probably but achieving 20% target of blending is not easy and needs a concerted effort by the various stakeholders besides a very explicit policy clarity from the government i mean the society of indian automobile manufacturers estimated that in 1920 only 10% of the uh, quantity of ethanol was uh, blended which was 50% of the petrol pumps so effectively e10 turned into just 5% blending it has improved now it is around 8% and to achieve high levels of blending up to e20 there are some bottlenecks which need to be addressed and and these are in government focus action is taking place it's not that nothing is happening on the ground things are uh, really improving but the, there are challenges on the vehicle manufacturers and also to make the vehicles material and fuel efficiency compatible with e20 which was covered but uh, i shall restrict my remarks to from the inter sugar industry perspective the mills are highly concentrated in some regions and interstate movement of ethanol has to be smooth the central government as was mentioned has amended the industrial development and regulation act to ensure the same but not all sales have, states have implemented it the other amended provisions are still pending um, implementation with some states as a result the states that produce ethanol more than required for blending these restriction on transportations on uh, ethanol can be an issue in case other facilities based on alternate crops come up in these states as is being envisaged this problem becomes more profound it is due to probably these regional imbalances that 50% of the petrol pumps nozzles in india are still supplying e0 the problem being more acute in northeastern states the transportation of ethanol to different plants to different parts for blending increases the cost of logistics and transport related emissions so probably these issues also are being addressed too and uh, would remain in focus then making ethanol from cane syrup or juice directly is a problem technicality because of due huge amount of effluent that is generated we should be allowed to use this effluent spent wash to be sprayed as an organic fertilizer in the farmer fields that would help in the disposal of this and make uh, it economical to go the juice route this uh, when if we do that then the cane requirement will go up automatically and due to time timely payment of cane on account of ethanol working cycle capital cycle being shorter than sugar the farmers should also produce more sugar cane by increasing the area under sugar cane coverage and also better varieties would be adopted this will benefit this is beneficial to all concerned and give a boost to the ethanol blending program so these are some of the things that uh, need to be taken care of sure thanks a lot mr manakala you have given the uh, story from the sugar industry side uh, let me ask mr banka on the other side how is it looking uh, continuing with the higher blending uh, targets uh, production of higher ethanol compatible vehicles is one of the big challenges as per the guidelines uh, vehicles with e20 e10 engine are to be rolled out uh, from april 2023 and vehicles with e20 engines are to be rolled out uh, from april 2025 the sugar industry would be watching the developments there to get the confidence that 20% blending would be possible by 2025 isn't it yeah you are right uh, in a sense uh, uh, the sugar industry has already exhibited its uh, enthusiasm and uh, their seriousness in uh, ramping up the capacities so it's for the uh, you know the uh, demand side for them to uh, ramp up uh, their uh, uh, you know capabilities to absorb this kind of ethanol which sugar industry will be able to supply to them uh, government is working very seriously in this direction and uh, there are active uh, there have been dialogues with the uh, Uh, society of automobile manufacturers and uh, uh, you know with the sugar industry also being involved so uh, e20 vehicles are going the roll out of e20 vehicles is uh, going to be made mandatory as has been announced by the government so uh, if you read the report of niti ayog on this so they they have a strategy to take it uh, step by step and see that you know by 2025 or uh, 20% blending is uh, possible uh it's a daunting task of course uh, to uh, go up to 20% but uh, uh, you know even if not 20% even if we go beyond 15% i would, 
uh, I would call it a very satisfactory uh, achievement. So anyways, we're keeping our fingers crossed and uh, hopefully all, all stakeholders are working in all the seriousness, including the government, the sugar industry, the automobile manufacturers, the petroleum ministry, all uh, as was told by Mr. Gupta earlier that, you know, the dispensing units also, you know, the, the, that's a, that's another big challenge. So uh, work is going on in that direction also. So uh, we are optimistic, uh, you know, if not 20, we should get closer to that number. Oh, oh, great, uh, great to hear that uh, most yeah, of the stakeholders are working. Like, yeah, yeah, sure. sure. Like what Mr. said that the government should possibly announce how it will move forward on this ethanol blending path after a GBE 20, so that the vehicle manufacturers keep this in mind while taking up expansion and modernization capex decisions at their plants. I mean, just to ensure that uh, their facilities are future ready. Absolutely. Exactly. I mean, I mean, good that the stakeholders are all working towards uh, achieving this. It will also help the ESG goals of the country. And probably, uh, although it's challenging times, but I think uh, I am sure the stakeholders are working towards uh, ensuring that this happens. Uh, I am sure the audience has been anxiously waiting with some questions. Uh, we can have the Q&A session, and I request if Jasmine can coordinate with the, the questions from the audience. Jasmine? Yes. Uh, so, uh, I'd request the participants to uh, maybe key in their queries in the panel uh, so that we can start the Q&A session. We can take a one minute break, um, um, maybe a, a short break, and then we can start with the questions. So. So a couple of questions I have uh, started receiving and I can start. So uh, Baka sir, for you, the first question, uh, any update on the OMC ha uh, OMCs, have they started accepting the tripartite agreement? So you briefly touched upon the SBI SOPs and uh, that the tripartite agreement is, is a requirement. So this yeah. question is perhaps from from there, sir. Uh, I, have, I have not heard it from horse's mouth, but uh, what I understand uh, from our industry associations discussions, uh, as well as uh, you know our interaction with TFPD, such agreements have been, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, are under execution. I, if you ask me to quote a case, uh, okay, I mean, uh, one instance, perhaps I'll not be able to do so. Uh, because uh, like i said you know uh, uh, we fall under a different category so we have been able to get whatever required financial assistance from the bank uh, is yeah. concerned right okay okay so uh, so anybody else on uh, maybe um, mr nalin uh, mr manaktala on on this uh, aspect any uh, thoughts so nothing from my side is right on this. Thing. Okay. I think I mean we've never heard. I was not heard of any agreement which is seen an agreement that has been ex actually been executed. But okay. like, uh, talks are all around, so something could come out of it, like Mr. Bankar. Okay. 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 So the next question is: um, Is ethanol produced from sugarcane more superior than ethanol produced from grains? Narin sir, uh, can you respond to this? As such, I don't see technically there is no change. Green, uh, I mean, if we see that technically it's 99.6 uh, and 7%. So I don't see any uh, margin of uh, any gap in ethanol derived out of grain and uh, ethanol derived out of sugarcane or molasses. Same, almost same. Ethanol is ethanol, basically. Yes. It's not like, uh, okay. uh, you know, uh, for a portable liquor, uh, you know, uh, you, you always, uh, one always feels that, you know, uh, portable uh, uh, spirit uh, made out of grains is superior and that made out of uh, molasses is uh, inferior. So here, mm -hmm. I think there's no, no distinction whatsoever, according to me. Yeah, but yeah, alcohol is yeah, please, uh -huh. please. Alcohol, I would drive out of uh, grain. Alcohol, 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 alcohol. 
may be better in portable because of its sensory values qualities yeah. so in portable it is may be considered to be better not in ethanol okay. Okay, so for blending purposes, it's it's like pretty yeah. much the same. It won't really make a difference. Right. Exactly. All right. Okay. Uh, the next question is that um, what are your thoughts on the potential imports of ethanol, and uh, what would be the key hurdles, if any? Anybody maybe can take that. Uh, so let, let me take this. I mean, the import of alcohol and the logistic cost in uh, considering the logis logistic cost from port to the factories and to the OMCs, it's too expensive, frankly. As for me, this is as of now, considering the present prices, is not viable. Okay. For well, blending purposes and all, as for me, it's not viable. Of course, the chemical industries used to import for their own purposes like ethyl acetate ethyl they use they import alcohol but not for blending purposes the whole blending program is to save for an exchange hmm. so we, 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 we have never thought of importing <laughs> uh, <laughs> never thought, yeah. okay. Okay. Uh, i mean mr gupta has mentioned it you know the cost uh, is prohibitive so not thinkable at this point in time. Okay. Okay. So the uh, I'll come to the next question. Uh, uh, so uh, can the spike which EBP is seeing currently, or the roadmap which is laid down for E20, can this be disrupted by EV vehicles? And uh, what are your thoughts on this? Uh, so, uh, Bakasam, maybe you can uh, take that first and then we can have uh, others also briefly respond on this question. See, uh, electrical vehicles are going to take a long time to come. So, uh, I don't see any disruption in the ethanol blending program on account of uh, the advent of uh, EV vehicles. Uh, you see, in Brazil, uh, they've been discussing, uh, you know, uh, that uh, I don't know if you have uh, heard uh, Mr. Nastari saying this, uh, that, you know, EV vehicles, uh, not directly, indirectly, are uh, uh, will cause more harm to the environment uh, because of uh, you know the thermal usage, etc. So, but anyways, uh, EV vehicles are going to take quite some time, and uh, we, we honestly don't see any disruption in our ethanol blending program. Mm. I agree with Mr. Banka. See, we have example of other developed countries where EV were, was introduced, I mean, uh, around ten years back. And they are still not able to replace this uh, ethanol with EV. And Mr. Bunker rightly pointed out that ultimately the EV power that is being generated out of fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. right? right. So probably that is one of the reasons. So again, I mean, I don't see really don't see any disruption happening to ethanol. Yeah, maybe higher blending of ethanol would be more environment friendly than EV right. vehicles given the fossil fuel usage and also disposal of the batteries. That can become an issue going forward. So another similar uh, question is that uh, you know, th this window of diverting sugar to ethanol exists till green hydrogen comes into play. Somebody is asking on how that would impact. Again, in very I would uh, it would be very mature to say anything on this yeah world over the discussions Maybe. are happening future seems to be of hydrogen even in india we have uh, seen some discussion happening on green uh, energy drive out of hydrogen but technologically it seems a bit like distant away hmm. yeah. on a commercial basis it has not been tested as such so what will happen is anybody's guess right right um uh, sir, there is a question on uh, that sugar companies are planning to demerge the ethanol units from sugar, and that is a plan. Um, uh, uh, so, you know, going forward, this then the two companies would run on arm's length basis. So, will this impact the profitability metrics of sugar companies? I don't think how it would help, you know, uh, to demerge uh, and, uh, you know, have two. Uh, companies 
firstly uh, you know any scheme of de merger uh, it has to be tax neutral but uh, as we have seen uh, such schemes can never be tax neutral because uh, if you have de merged the sugar unit uh, uh, you know the distillery segment and make it into another company you'll have to transfer land uh, uh, well, i mean there are going to be stamp duty implications and uh, i mean if uh, then again, you know, of course, we are in the GST regime where, you know, there is an input tax credit available. But uh, we are following, uh, you know, uh, uh, in case of molasses, for example, the uh, GST rate is very high, whereas in case of ethanol, the rate is very low. So uh, the entire uh, input tax uh, uh, credit, uh, you know, uh, would, would go waste according to me. So these kind of schemes are not tax neutral on the contrary these schemes uh, uh, would entail uh, uh, you know some definitely outgo in terms of taxes etc so according to me it doesn't make any sense at all the others would like to add i totally agree with mr banka of course apart from the cost inefficient of this type of demergers ultimately see government whatever incentives are coming from the government they are coming for the sugar industry for the sugar mills correct correct not for the ethanol companies yeah. if they yeah. get demers themselves so the kind of benefit we are uh, as of now getting in sugar uh, ethanol segments probably that all will go away yeah for the sugar company to be viable i mean it's, it's necessary to capture the whole value chain of sugar within the same company mm. otherwise uh, even if you demerge, then uh, you transfer on the market price based on the today. Also, we transfer the joint product based on the NRV. So, overall profitability, I don't see any advantage of uh, going this route except complications. Right. Sure. So, questions on sugarcane availability is there. So, uh, is it sufficient for the kind of distillery capacity we are talking about uh, with some obvious growth in sugar consum consumption also that can come? So, uh, would the um, you know sugarcane availability be there? And another related uh, question which has come is that UP has shown a more stable sugarcane production, and uh, you know it's a it's a better irrigated belt, uh, better recoveries are there from the early variety, uh, whereas Maharashtra, Karnataka they continue to be rain fed uh, or rather you know drought prone. So, given this fact, uh, you know can a stable produce of sugarcane be there for the success of the ABP program? So, you know, we have briefly covered in our uh, presentation that, uh, you know, as per us, uh, you know, we are talking of the 6 million tons and, uh, you know, if that gets diverted um, towards uh, the ethanol production and this this kind of, uh, you know, rollout uh, is, is possible. And, and we have, uh, you know, experience of past few years wherein this kind of uh, ex uh, surplus is available in the industry. But no, going uh, no, I think... The surplus should remain available for foreseeable future even because the i mean the sugar production and the cane availability is not going to go down so ethanol bending program at a higher level with exports not being a certainty in a, in the future should uh, not lead to any shortage of sugar and cane availability should be sufficient perhaps particularly when with the ethanol bending you are able to pay them pay the farmers in time you are pay, better to pay them better your working capital cycle reduces so it's it's been a win-win situation for them also to have more uh, sugar cane probably the acreage will go up and uh, the yields will become better due to okay. better varieties because then you'll be able to invest in them also correct mr uh, it mentioned rightly like sugar cane crop is the most beneficial crop as you mentioned in your uh, com presentation compared with other crops so uh, in my opinion this is not going to go down considering that sugar cyclicality is now no more there and uh, sugar companies are in better position their financial health is very good and farmers are getting their price and uh, sugar cane price being the highest of other cash, cash crop comparative cash crop so i don't think there is going to be any downside on this hmm. And probably the effort also in growing sugar cane is lesser than other crops for the farmer. Yeah. 
Right, sir. Uh, with the recent hike in the ethanol prices, um, does it fully offset the increase in FRP announced in August 21, which is effective October 21? And how much accretive, if any, uh, it would be on the margin front uh, for the millers? So I think there are two two parts to it. Yeah. Uh, first is that uh, does it fully offset? Are... We we are we are under SAP mechanism. So if you see the percentage increase in SAP has been higher, uh, the percentage increase in FRP is lesser. But uh, uh, I mean, in the last three four years, there has been no increase in the SAP. So there has been increase in the price of uh, ethanol based on uh, FRP increase. So uh, maybe uh, you know temporarily it may seem that yes, uh, we are not being fully compensated for the increase in the SAP. But uh, uh, I mean, we have to look at the larger picture. We have to see how much, uh, I mean, in any case, uh, ethanol is a better proposition because it helps you uh, sacrifice sugar production and uh, moderate your sugar inventory. Right, just to add on that point, other advantage of uh, sugar prices remaining higher. So yep. it's not a simple equation of one is to one that how much you divert and how much uh, sugar very, price would be. Very true, very true. Correct, correct, yeah. yeah. Right. <clears throat> uh, sir, um, uh, Nalin, sir, uh, uh, bee heavy molasses is very remunerative. Um, and we have seen the uh, proportion of uh, be heavy uh, increasing uh, you know with uh, with passing years um, at what level of sugar prices do you think it is more remunerative for millers to produce sugar and not ethanol are you on mute sir see mathematically if i see if i say say 37 rupees is the break even point for shifting from ethanol to sugar but it cannot be simple like that See, because of ethanol, we get B heavy uh, uh, ethanol because we are sacrificing sugar. We get better capacities in it, uh, distillery capacity from the same set of plant. We get better quality of sugar in our sugar plant. And see, ethanol program, we are logged up one year upfront. We can visualize our uh, top line. So we are locked for one year. So we are uh, mm -hmm. like on the sugar sacrificed. We avoid our. Uh, variation of the sugar price so i mean the only the price cannot be a, a game changer and a reason for shifting from uh, ethanol to sugar it has to be mathematically if it is 37 it, it has to be much higher than that right yes i agree i agree with that totally because uh, you 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 just can't uh, have a one to one a sort of a mathematical equation in this because the moment you, we are we are we are structurally we are here the sh excess to production is has to stay for some time Absolutely. so if you increase that production even further by reducing b heavy then the prices might come down and uh, on the whole normal sales also you might lose so that is that uh, equation won't work like this correct see we cannot take a myopic view of the situation we have to think long term we have to think holistically we cannot uh, just be guided by some uh, spurts in the sugar prices. Uh, well, sugar prices increases are good, but uh, one must remember that the sugar prices have gotten better only because we have produced sacrificed sugar production and, uh, and increasingly producing more ethanol from the sugar sacrificed. Yes, sir. Right, right, sir. Correct. Yeah, so, uh, sir, I'm just uh, taking a last uh, question since we are pretty much approaching the closing time of the webinar. So, um, there are many uh, similar questions and I'm just, um, uh, you know, framing um, along with our messages of, uh, of the webinar, I'm framing a question and for your closing comments. So, you know, the key messages that we put out are that the industry cyclicality will get reduced as we go forward. Uh, we are saying that the prices will remain firm, uh, you know, with because of the diversion of uh, towards ethanol, 
uh, and uh, we are also saying that um, uh, that exports uh, will also uh, remain uh, quite uh, remunerative uh, in the in the medium term and and all these factors together would lead to the structural change in in the industry uh, going forward so we want uh, your uh, comments last comments every maybe everyone uh, we want your comments sir on this what what are your views you can start with you nalin sir yeah so uh, you rightly mentioned because of the so many things so sugar industry as of now is doing good but ethanol has really been the game changer and it's like win-win situation for all the stakeholders from the countries to the last step uh, last part of the economy the farmers so benefits are like just flowing up to every stakeholder so yeah sugar industry uh, structural change have happened and the sugar industry itself is ready to adopt those changes very fast sure sure um Vineet, sir yeah i mean if we see the cyclicity has been reduced to a large extent by this ethanol push which is beneficial for all the people involved in the value chain both sugar and ethanol at least for the present the continuing policy that the government is adopting is uh, seems to be pragmatic and uh, based on the emerging situation there would, might be a need to tweak the policy a bit so that the advantages continue. And the bottom line being that we now need to be very proactive to changes at the ground, whether it's happening in the production side or uh, export side, and not be reactive, not be reactive as some some years back as we were, and we wish to react only after significant damage had already been done. So, but the industry is the center of this transformation, and. Uh, all the aspects that you have mentioned are certainly going to be a game changer for the industry and uh, lead to a permanent structural change in the operating parameters. Right, sir. Um, Baka, sir, last comments from you. You see, uh, what's happened over the last few years is because of the successive increase in the sugarcane prices, farmers have taken to growing more and more sugarcane. So, as a result, uh, we in India, if if so I'm, I'm talking about at the gross level. Uh, we are capable of producing about 34 to 35 million tons of sugar. So uh, as, as the government's objective is, and, and, and we are all working towards the, that particular objective, is to eventually sacrifice about 6 million tons of uh, sugar production. So when we sacrifice 6 million tons of product, sugar production, and if we assume that the consumption is also in, improve, uh, increasing a little, you know, uh, I think in your presentation, you mentioned about I think the voice has stopped coming. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Signal, signal situation. I seem to have lost the connection or something. This is it. Okay. No, so, uh, yeah, well, now, I, I, I think, yeah, yeah, so it's okay. So, um, uh, yeah, so uh, that was the last question, and uh, uh, I would uh, want to thank all the participants for keying in these queries um, and, and the panelists to, to take uh, uh, these queries. Uh, now, I will hand over to Mr. Bhagwat for closing the session. Uh, thanks, Jasmine, for the q and session, which was well conducted. I sincerely thank Mr. Banka, uh, Mr. Nalin Gupta, Mr. Vinit Manaktala for joining us for this webinar and giving their valuable inputs. And thank you to all the participants for taking their time out and being part of this care ratings webinar and look for your participation in future also. I hope this session was useful. For any queries, feedback or suggestion, please respond in the feedback mail, which will be coming to you no sooner the web webinar ends. Thank you and goodbye for now. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.